In astronomy, there's a shape that shows up again and again and again. I speak, of course, of disks. We see them all over the universe, from black holes to ring systems to young stars to galaxies to new planets to flying saucers. Okay, maybe not that last one. <laughs> it's not a cosmic conspiracy, it's just physics. The main reason that disks occur so much is angular momentum. Let's not get bogged down in the details like this equation for angular momentum, but the important thing to note here is that this is a conserved quantity. For example, when a figure skater moves their limbs, they can change their i, that's their moment of inertia, which causes their omega, which is their angular velocity, to change because l has to stay the same. So if you consider a system that has some central object and a bunch of particles with just random motions that are attracted to that central object, each of those particles has some individual amount of angular momentum. And if you summed up all of those individual amounts, you would end up with a net angular momentum. And that net angular momentum is conserved for that system. And the arrow here on the L is not just decorative, it's not just a little hat. It means that angular momentum is actually a vector quantity, which means that it has some direction. That's important because if you have a direction, that also means you're defining a plane that is perpendicular to that direction. And I think maybe you might begin to see where I'm going with this. Now, I lied before when I said that angular momentum was the reason that we have disks because there's another extremely important component here and that is collisions. When particles collide with one another, they exchange that angular momentum, but the total amount is conserved. But those interactions also produce energy, and that energy can be radiated away from the system. So as the energy in the system goes down, the particles begin to settle into low energy states, which happens to be circular orbits. But they can't get rid of that pesky angular momentum, and so those orbits spread out within that plane that we talked about earlier. And because those particles are getting closer to the central object, the moment of inertia of the entire system is going down. So the spinning is becoming much more significant. So that's how you start with a cloud of particles that are all traveling in random directions, and you end up with a disk of material that's all orbiting in the same direction. So if you need both angular momentum and collisions to make these disks, what happens if you don't have collisions? You remember I mentioned galaxies as an example of where we see disks in the universe. Well, actually, that's just the visible part of the galaxy. That's because visible matter, which is gas and dust and the stars that are made from it, has all of those lovely collisions. But galaxies also have a lot of non-visible matter that we call dark matter. And dark matter doesn't interact with itself, which means it doesn't have collisions. So actually, dark matter creates roughly spherical halos around the more disk-like visible portion of the galaxy. Now, of course, this is just a general idea of what's happening. If you get into the specifics, there's a lot of really interesting complications and you get things like thick disks and thin disks and jets and flaring disks and turbulent disks and so on and so on, giving astronomers a lot of really fun things to study and learn about. But at the heart of it, the universe is chock full of disks because of angular momentum and collisions. I'll leave you with this cool simulation from NASA to watch, showing how a disk, in this case a galaxy, can form over time from a random collapsing cloud of particles. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more space and astronomy videos. I'll see you soon. Bye!